Welcome back to Winners and Losers, the show that looks at the highs and the lows from around world football this weekend. And we start with a quick talking point this weekend. We do. What is it? Because we already covered the Arsenal-Liverpool game on the football social pretty extensively. Cue montage of Dave Jackson's reaction to the game. Go on, go on, Charles! Yes! What is going on here? Go on. In the box. Yes! 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 Come on! Yes! Yes! Come on! <laughs> oh, that top's gone. Yeah, Dave Jackson in incredible form there on the football social. We are doing another live watch along this week for Juventus versus Manchester United on Armchair Fans right here in this studio. Make sure you tune in on Wednesday. Anyway, back to the game in question, which was, of course, Arsenal versus Liverpool ended in a 1-1 draw. It meant that Arsenal maintain their 12-game unbeaten streak, which is start. much to everyone's surprise at the start of this campaign because Unai Emery's men were supposed to be a little bit more of a work in progress, let's say, although they have been riding their luck, it must be said. But improvement nonetheless against Liverpool, who they've lost three of the last four meetings with, conceding 13 goals in the process. Last night, or Saturday night even, um, they had 62% possession Arsenal, so controlled large parts of the game and managed to stifle that counter-attack by and large. Obviously, Mane and Salah had a few good runs, didn't they? But ultimately fizzled out to nothing. Emery's also brought new life to Hector Bellerin, who finished last campaign with five assists. He's got four so far this season and was another standout performer yesterday, along with Lucas Torreira, who you're going to speak about, yes. Joseph. Yeah, I mean, he's turned out to be a brilliant signing by Unai sure. Emery, hasn't he? And it's almost as if we told you that last season. But, like I said, he slots in really nicely alongside Granit Xhaka, kind of two ball-winning midfielders, I suppose you'd say. I think that uh, Granit Xhaka had more ball recoveries than any other Arsenal player last season, and Lucas Torreira has also come in to do that job. He protects the back four really well, and he also allows Xhaka to be slightly more progressive. Last season, only Paul Pogba attempted more through balls from midfield in the entire league than Xhaka. So if there's one thing he's good at, it's progressing the ball forward. But his defensive work does leave a little bit to be desired, whereas Torreira is an absolute monster. 3.6 tackles and interceptions per 90 so far this season. I think he's arguably been one of the bargain signings of the entire summer at £26 million. Don Smalley. If you guys can think of any other bargain signers, let us know in the comments below. But he's turned out to be an absolute gem for Emery. Yeah, like we said, Arsenal fans maybe don't get too excited at this point. A more in-depth analysis would suggest your side are overperforming somewhat. Your expected goal difference putting you mid-table below Leicester. Arsenal Jeez. currently fifth place, one point behind Spurs in fourth. Now, last night keep saying last night, Saturday night, Liverpool also created 13 chances. That's one more than Emery's men. So Arsenal did have to ride their luck again to an extent. And against Palace, there are also signs that Emery's not quite fixed. Arsenal progressing it out of defence. Yeah. Still vulnerable down the wing when they're committing those fullbacks in an Unai Emery system. Obviously, fullbacks have licence to roam, but Arsenal maybe don't have that relationship with their midfield and defence at the moment where someone seamlessly slots into a back three. Torreira, of course, starting to fill those shoes. So maybe the signs are there of a more coherent system. But Arsenal fans, what do you think? Are you getting ahead of yourselves or are you remaining realistic? We we'll know which one Dave Jackson is. Let us know what you are in the comments below. Before we dive into our first suggestion from Aiden underscore Toner underscore 67, a big fan of printing solutions, apparently. He's got Man City in there. We want to plug the podcast. Go and download How to Solve a Problem Like Real Madrid. Episode 2 of Sunday Vibes Extra Time. It's in the description below. Maybe it's the top comment as well. Maybe I'm in the comments pushing you all towards it. Anyway, Manchester City were absolutely delectable against Southampton. Great word. Break it down. Great word. They were delicious. 6-1. They annihilated the Saints at the head Etihad. To reclaim top spot, obviously, goals coming from Vesley Hood, who hit an own goal. Aguero, Silva, Sterling got a double, and Sane. Um, they did concede. England's getting a 30th minute penalty to come back and bite me on the arse, because I let him go in the draft, didn't I? For Gabby Jesus. That's worked out really well. <laughs> um, but Guardiola's men have won eight of their last nine games, and this was the first time they've conceded in the last six. 
absolutely frightening at the back. Pep Guardiola, obviously in this post-match, bemoaning his defence a little bit, not particularly happy with how they lined up, but nevertheless, they still smacked in six. And it's the fourth time already this season they've scored five or more goals. Since Pep took over, they've done it 12 times. That's double the nearest side, and I believe the nearest side is Liverpool. Goliola. It's insane. They can't stop scoring. They flew out of the blocks in this one. 81% possession in the opening 20 minutes. They were 3 0 up after 18 minutes. When the third one in, when, yeah. when the third goal went in after 18 minutes, this, I thought it was going to be 11. It was like year nines playing year sixes, wasn't it? It was a form of bullying in the opening 18. And I was, I actually thought Mark Hughes was going to walk out. I know. Mark, <laughs> Mark Hughes should have just got out at half time, got in his car, and driven home because just it was. Into no the Welsh coming back, sunset. was there? Absolutely no coming back. Aguero also got his 150th Premier League goal on just his 217th game. Only Alan Shearer has got there quicker than him. What a player, what a performance and what a result for Guardiola. Just like Nats, weren't they? Just these diminutive 5 for 8 players just running absolute riot. In contrast, Southampton are now 16th in the league, just two points above the drop zone Jesus. and haven't won in the league for seven games. Now, Ings' goal was their first for 505 minutes in the competition, and it was the first City had conceded in 630 minutes. Wow. So, a bit of a collector's item there for Danny Ings scoring against City. I think Tottenham only had four touches in the box against City the other week, so Danny Ings can count as lucky stars that Edison's absolutely flattened him. Anyway, they're having such a strange season, Southampton. Only City, Chelsea and Wolves are taking more shots than their 14.5 per game, but they only managed to get 4.5 on target. It's almost as if Shane Long and Danny Ings and Gabby Adini, not Danny Ings, I'm not counting him in this company because he's a good little player, but everyone else around him could not hit a barn door with a banjo. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, 4.5 shots on target represents the 11th best in the division. So a little bit more uh, readily explainable. Only four players have scored for the Saints this season, and Danny Ings is the only player who scored more than two. Jesus. I think he's on five goals. Conversely, Sergio Aguero cannot stop scoring, can he? He's injury-free now. He's feeling better than ever. They're his own words, and he is absolutely obliterating the opposition. He was immense in his game. His 90 reads as follows. Four shots, four key passes. Jesus Christ. Is an elite striker and creator, apparently. Four tackles and interceptions. Apparently, he's elite, an elite defender as well. What's going on? I couldn't even get my words out then. Four dribbles. Two assists and a goal. That is a ridiculous 90 minutes of football from Jesus the Argentine. Christ. But man of the match, somehow he was usurped to the man of the match award, was Raheem Sterling. Four shots, three key passes, two tackles and interceptions, two goals and two assists. What's happening? And he is a beast this season, isn't he? He's now contributed to 25 goals in 19 home games since the start of last season. That's obscene. Well worth the 300k a week. Give him what he wants. Yeah. Next up, Southampton hosts Watford next weekend. So that'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Watford a little bit unfortunate to lose this week. While Manchester City plays Shakhtar on Wednesday in the Champions League before playing Manchester United next week. It's the big Sunday. one. A big week for the citizens. You should be in your pants. Yeah, I am. Our first losers, Crystal Palace. Maybe a little bit harsh. This one was sent in by Ardash. Ardash, you're harsh. Why? What was that? Terrible. Anyway, yes, this fixture has proved tricky for Chelsea of late. Prior to Sunday's matchup, the West London side had actually lost two of their last three against Roy's men. So somewhat of a voodoo side. Now, Palace have also been better away from Selhurst Park in 1819 taking six of their eight points on the road. So this wasn't a foregone conclusion by any mm. means. And after the hour mark, it looked like it might be a case of more drop points for the Blues when Andros Townsend registered his third career goal against Chelsea, drawing Palace level. And in Zach's words, Palace were all right, first off. Zaha is a maniac. Yeah, his feet are filled. Ferrari feet. Anyway, in reality, this just stirred the beast, didn't it? Sarri got annoyed, he brought Hazard on, he brought Kovacic on, and the former got an assist, and the latter completed three dribbles in 26 minutes. So he just rolled out the big guns, and they proceeded to flatten Palace. Um, now, after their level up, Palace only had three more shots. Chelsea took eight, finishing with six on target to Palace's two. So why you say... There might be a little bit unlucky to be in our losers. It was quite a convincing victory come the 90s, especially with Alvaro Morata failing to clinch a hat-trick with that little dink at the end. Oh, 
Crystal clear, should have gone round. Yeah. He, he probably could have, but equally he'd be pretty happy to get a brace, won't he? It's the first time he's scored in back-to-back -back Premier League games in a year, running all the way back to November 2017. And as a result, he's now got five goals in just seven starts. He's averaging a goal every 121 minutes. I think there's only three players in the league that are a better ratio. Hazard, Aguero and Albaumiang. So congratulations, Alvaro Morata. Of course, one of his goals was assisted as well by Pedro, who also got on the score sheet, didn't he? It's his fourth in just six starts. He's playing really well under Maurizio Sarri. The Spaniard took three shots, completed five dribbles, second best on the pitch behind Wilfred Zaha, of course, Ferrari feet, and completed three tackles, although he was dispossessed three times. I would say he's one of the best bench options in the entire league. Yeah, I'd agree. The depth across that front line. Brilliant. I mean, they lost who to Valencia? Bashwai. Bashwai, and they let Tammy Abraham go. Yeah. So, but still got Pedro. Yeah, Pedro is in frightening Enjoy. form off the bench. Chelsea as well are in frightening form. They've scored at least three goals in five of their last six games, with the Blues' goal difference only only bettered, sorry, by Manchester City, of course, who keep scoring five, don't they? Sarri is now unbeaten in his first 11 Premier League games, matching the record set by Frank Clark. In what year? Do you know it? If you do, let us know in the comments below with Nottingham Big up Forest. Frank. Huh? Big up Frank. Yeah, not that super Frank, the other one. Super Frankie Clark. Our final winner comes from OM Money B How, and he suggested Newcastle because the team that couldn't hit water if they fell out of a boat have finally seen the net ripple for about the third time this season, haven't well, they? Well, it's their first win of the entire campaign, and it came against yeah. a pretty good Watford side. They beat him 1 0, didn't they? And they ended their winless run in the process, lifting themselves out of the relegation zone when a Yosi Perez headed in that key Sung Young free kick for just their seventh goal. Seventh goal, Man City scored six on the weekend. I know City are a different league, but still, just their seventh goal of the season. It was the 25-year-olds, this is a Yosi Perez's first Premier League goal in 11 mm. games. He obviously netted twice against Chelsea on the final day of last season, didn't he? Uh, they failed to get a single shot on target last week at Southampton, and despite the fact in this one, I think they had 10 shots, they only got two on target again. The problem remains the forwards for Newcastle United. Their front line is absolutely hounding. It's mm. dirty. Hosselu, a Yosi Perez. Who else is up there? But I mean, 10 shots is, is a fairly poor return. So it can't just be the forwards. It's how they work it into those areas as well. Where's yeah. the creativity in that side? Like, Key is a decent deep line playmaker, but. I mean, it's, all on, it's all on Voldemort, isn't it? It's all on John Joe to play those special passes. And it didn't help when he came off injured early doors. Then Jamal Lasselle came off injured. Then uh, Muto came off injured as well, all within the hour. It means basically that they had to use their substitutes early. And it actually worked out all right, as Newcastle subs are now to thank for 43% of their goals this season. Or in other words... 0.1. <laughs> Almost half. Yeah. But the Magpies probably did deserve a little bit of luck in this game because the other week against Brighton, they had 24 shots and came away with nothing. So this might be Lady Luck balancing things out. But that first half was like the Alamo at St. James's Park. Watford had 16 shots in total. 13 of them came in the opening 45. So they were getting absolutely peppered. And a bit of retribution for Rafa Benitez, of course, Javi Gracia's men defeating them 3-0 on Geordie side last campaign, their worst home defeat. So revenge is a dish best served cold. Served, get it, because he looks like a waiter. Ha ha ha. Anyway, Watford, we said they had 16 attempts, they weren't very clinical at all. In fact, they were nigh on terrible, putting a poultry one on target and Talking of wasteful, Delefeu, not great in this game, missed the hatch of chances in the opening half. Gracia said the loss was difficult to accept post-match and they had a chance to kill the game but didn't score. Insightful stuff there. Now, eighth place, Watford will be hoping to get back on winning form by taking on Southampton next week and Newcastle have Bournemouth, I believe. So two games you'll probably want to steer clear of. Let's move on into our final section. Our final loser of the day was submitted by Patrick Bale on Twitter, and he says Brighton. Yeah, after three 1 0 wins in the bounce, 12th place Brighton were chewed out by the toffees. How'd you like that one? 
get it down, you are. Anyway, it was away from home, and they lost 3-1. It's been coming, though, for a very long time, Joseph. In the three games that preceded this, the Seagulls only registered seven shots on target, escaping with nine points. Just one more than Southampton managed against City this That's match crazy. week. Now, they only took five shots in total in this game to Everton's 14, testing Pitford just twice. And shot location is generally okay for the goals. 19 of the last 29 efforts have come from inside the box, but they're really, really struggling with volume. Mm. Okay, so they're overly reliant on Glenn Murray's efficiency in front of goal at current, and surely that conversion rate will plateau. He currently has six expected goals, puts him closer to around four. So he's kind of riding his luck at the moment as it is. Brighton only averaging 7.8 shots on goal per wow. 90 in the Premier League this term, placing them rock bottom on the charts. One full effort below the magisterial attacking talents of Burnley. <laughs> right, and when your better defensive players dunk in this incident are uh, making errors leading to goals in the 76th minute, it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, especially when the error is being forced by players of the quality of Rick Carlison, who ran riot in this game. Obviously, the Toffees moved up to ninth thanks to his brace. The Brazilian's 90 was as follows. Three dribbles, four aerial duels, one tackle, one key pass, four shots. All of which, by the way, we're talking about shot locations, came from inside the box. He's now scored more goals in nine games this campaign than in 38 games last season. He's got you know six what? this year, he got five last year. If they don't add his pigeon celebration to FIFA as well, I'm converting to Pro Eva. Is that his celebration? The pigeon? He does it for Brazil. I don't know if he does it for Everton. I hope he does do it for Everton, but That's when class. I went to university, if you called someone a pigeon, they're a moron. Yeah. So I don't know I don't know whether or they're not. A weasel. Is it yeah, I don't know whether it's a good idea to be doing the pigeon celebration. Uh, he is still just twenty one years old of course and it's only the fourth time this season he's played straight through the middle mm. and he's racked up his third goal whilst playing in that position. He's only taking 2.4 shots per 90, I believe, which is actually less than Gilfie Sigurdsson. So if he can increase those numbers, expect to see his goals rise exponentially. Because Everton are quite heavily reliant on both him and Gilfie Sigurdsson. The attacking pair have had a hand in 13 of their 19 goals. They effectively need more chance creation, more goals from other areas. Theo Walcott needs to step up. I think Bernard needs to step up. They need some goals from midfield. Tosin, yeah. It's just not really enough going forward. Up next for Brighton, though, is a trip to 18th place to Cardiff. They've got to win that one, whilst Everton, they've got to go to the bridge, which oh, is dear. not a nice place to go at the moment under Maurizio Sarri. But nevertheless, Ricarlison's crushing it, but Brighton, so that's it for this episode of Winners and Losers, but there's plenty more great content on the channel, isn't there, Amster? There is. On Sunday, the match against Arsenal Fan TV went live. FDFC's first game since January when we took on Soccer AM. So, a bit of a collector's item at the moment. We hope they're going to happen more regularly. Me and Zach are going to try and sort some more games out. Make sure you clicked on it. Make sure you commented on it. Make sure you've watched it again. Make sure you've shared it. Zach worked very hard on the edits. So, be extra nice in the comments below. Bye.